Welcome to the uh, community session on Pathways to Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. I am Pushpendra Jhori, your host, and um, along with me is um, Rimji Magarwal, who is the session manager. Uh, the uh, this show is being uh, organized by RMSI, which is a geospatial analytics firm uh, engaged in disaster risk reduction activities across the globe, helping the governments um, reduce the risk from um, natural calamities and man-made calamities to buildings and infrastructure. <clears throat> so uh, let's start the session with, uh, with a small uh, background as to uh, what the session is going to be covering so that you have an understanding of uh, what to expect from the session. So while uh, rural, uh, while infrastructure is uh, very important for both rural and urban areas, but off late we have seen that there has been um, migration of, in fact, a lot of migration of people from the rural to the urban areas, to the extent that the uh, projections say that by 2050, uh, nearly most of the world will be living in the urban areas. And uh, we all, we all have seen uh, historically that um, settlements uh, come first and the infrastructure follows the, the settlements. So in that scenario, uh, the development of the infrastructure is anyway done in a constrained environment because of the settlements already being there. <coughs> that induces uh, several um, performance issues on the infrastructure. Now these issues get exacerbated because of uh, the additional impacts of the natural and climatic events. But in reality, durability and dependability is, should be the hallmark of uh, the infrastructure. Uh, if the infrastructure goes down, you know, it's not just the investment needed to bring it up online, but there is a lot of indirect impact that is associated with the infrastructure. So today, uh, next slide. Yeah. So today uh, we have a distinguished panel, uh, which is going to be uh, discussing and uh, will try to arrive at pathways for laying down an actionable framework for climate and disaster resilient infrastructure development. Uh, I will take you uh, to a little bit more uh, deep down uh, uh, assessment of why is it important to uh, have our infrastructure disaster resilient. And then we will uh, talk to Dr. Sushil Gupta and uh, Ms. Alpa Shet uh, about the vulnerability aspects of uh, the infrastructure. And finally, we will get into the crux of this session where we will discuss the pathways to disaster resilient infrastructure with our panelists, uh, Dr. Ali Maher from CIT, uh, Mr. Sandeep Pondrick from CDRI, and Mr. Jeffrey Uwema from Info Planning Group. So let's just start with, um, uh, with the initial uh, assessment in terms of why uh, it's so important to have our infrastructure disaster resilient. Next slide. <clears throat> So we all understand that uh, infrastructure is the lifeline of our socioeconomic development. You know, whatever we are, uh, production that we are creating, whatever the movement of goods to the market, uh, the, our ability to export, and uh, finally the, the quality of life, all these parameters are riding on top of the infrastructure. Next slide. <clears throat> But we have seen that infrastructure has been getting impacted every time there have been disasters. So um, a few cases in example here are, for example, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Uh, it took about a year to restore power. Uh, Cyclone Sidr, Bangladesh, impacted about 75 million people, suddenly lost access to uh, power. Uh, Hurricane Wilma, Florida, it the grid restoration took 16,000 workers working for weeks at a cost of 1.3 billion. So you can, we can see what is the kind of impact in terms of the direct losses that, that accrue because of uh, the, um, the infrastructure going offline. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> so but direct impact losses are not the only thing. The indirect losses, they 
surpass the uh, the direct losses when it comes to infrastructure because we lose our uh, supply chains we lose the uh, connectivity the all both of these re, uh, result in a strong business disruption and there is an additional impact in terms of increase in shelter and food needs because uh, even though the houses may or may not have been may not have been damaged but if the important utilities like potable water or electric power are missing then uh, we need to move them to shelter because it may or may not be possible for people to to live without both these so just to take a case an example what if we lose power there is a complete chain reaction that happens back to back so it's not just that we lose light we lose uh, our ability to uh, to refrigerate anything so that because of that the food storage is at risk because of that the medical uh, the medical supplies which are uh, are at risk we lose our ability to purify water because the air purifiers and water purifiers all are running on electricity and then transportation the entire rail network in most of the countries across the globe is right now riding on the electric powered engines so in reality think about it if just one infrastructure element causes such a delay such a chaos then what will happen if more than one get impacted next slide so what can we do uh, to uh, to reduce this risk or to address this risk next slide <clears throat> the first and the foremost thing is we need to understand what the risk really is uh, for that we need to start at the hazard we need to understand what are could be the potential hazard intensities at different locations then we need to understand where our infrastructure elements really are you know and what are their key characteristics combining the hazard and this exposure we can get an assessment of vulnerability by seeing how the infrastructure element might behave to the kind of intensity that it is subjected to because a specific hazard happening and that basically positions us for getting an understanding of what the risk could be <coughs> next slide once we have an understanding of risk we can move towards resilience um, the resilience uh, could be um, at uh, the origin or the source but uh, this may not be possible for every kind of hazard for example flood we cannot control uh, where how much rainfall is going to happen we may be able to put some retaining structures to uh, to avoid landslides so for that we need to have uh, limiting or uh, uh, approaches that limit propagation or the spread wherein uh, we can use check dams or uh, levees or um, uh, flood retention ponds etc but we still have hazards like earthquake and cyclone where we can't even limit the propagation so that the uh, the approaches then left for us are uh, to uh, retrofit our existing structures so that their performance uh, in terms of those events improves or any new structure that we are building has to be built at least to the code or if not if not better than the code depending upon what does the what is the kind of the structure that we are trying to build next slide <clears throat> but this risk to resilience process is is not very straightforward it's a, there are lots of uh, challenges and gaps associated to that the first and the foremost thing is that we don't really know where all our in infrastructure elements are they are pinpointed locations on the surface of earth along with their all the important characteristics <clears throat> and that leads to that leads to risk assessments which are which are not really very very uh, very very accurate in terms of giving us an idea what might really happen similarly uh, the focus on the vulnerability assessment so far has been more on you know buildings because we in, we were trying to save lives so there the focus was on residential structures schools hospitals so infrastructure from a vulnerability perspective has kind of lagged behind a little bit so but it is also uh, complicated because it's not just the function of the structure but also function of how well it has been maintained <clears throat> one of the reason for probably why infrastructure vulnerability is lagging behind is the unavailability of the historical loss data for the uh, of infrastructure because of various events that have happened in the past so uh, all these things are basically directing us that uh, the infrastructure uh, risk is very important and but 
it's not an easy path to follow. There are lots of gaps that we need to fill and there are lots of challenges. So we move forward uh, discussion uh, with our panelists to understand what their thoughts are about these gaps and challenges and how, what their suggestions are for filling them. Next slide. <clears throat> So let's move to our first uh, panel where we will be talking to Dr. Uh, Sushil Gupta as well as Ms. Alpashet regarding the uh, vulnerability of um, infrastructure elements. Uh, Dr. Sushil, we'll start with Dr. Sushil Gupta. Uh, Sushil is um, a disaster risk management specialist and he is also my colleague. <coughs> so uh, prior to joining RMSI, he, was, he worked for several years at Imperial Power, Nuclear Power Corporation of India. Uh, he is a seasoned vulnerability expert and has conducted the vulnerability assessments of buildings and infrastructures across the globe. So let's hear from uh, from Sushil about the key challenges to vulnerability assessment of infrastructure elements. Sushil. Thank you, Puspendra. Uh, Rimjim, can you next slide, please? Okay, when we say vulnerability, so vulnerability we can define as uh, degree of susceptibility and resilience of the community. Uh, and environment to hazards. Uh, vulnerability could be uh, different type. It could be social vulnerability, uh, where it impacts like uh, livelihood. It could be environmental vulnerability. It could be economic, or it could be physical vulnerability. So here, my focus is on physical vulnerability. We will be talking of physical vulnerability of infrastructure. Physical vulnerability can be defined as the potential for physical impact on built environment. So when we say built environment, building and infrastructure and population. Uh, it can be analyzed for group of const uh, constructions. Uh, for example, when we say structural type, which are having similar damage performances. Next. Uh, vulnerability modeling. Uh, uh, usually it is done uh, uh, using vulnerability indices, one, uh, discrete uh, vulnerability and continuous vulnerability curves. When I say indices, indices are mostly used for social vulnerability or environmental vulnerability where we don't uh, consider the relationship between hazard uh, and uh, with the inten hazard intensity with the damage. If I uh, go on the physical vulnerability, uh, physical vulnerability uh, for infrastructure or for uh, important structures, uh, we go with the uh, development of the damage, uh, damage functions or vulnerability functions. So vulnerability functions can be developed using analytical or engineering studies. We can use the, if it is available, historical loss data, uh, that is also uh, useful or uh, third approach is expert judgment or heuristic approach. Uh, and uh, these could be also like uh, validated or improved through combination of these three. Next. Uh, let me uh, take example of Cyclone Fani in India. Uh, uh, this was a uh, uh, category four a tropical cyclone, and uh, this was the biggest cyclone after the Odisha super cyclone of 1999 and 2014 cyclone felling. It impacted uh, almost uh, 89 fatalities, and uh, total loss was more than uh, 8 billion in dollar. The total power infrastructure uh, damage alone, if I see only the power infrastructure, it was more than USD 1.2 billion. It impacted five districts of Odisha state alone and another nine districts were extensively damaged. About 4 million people across the state were without power, uh, almost for 40 days. So if you see the infrastructure damage just for the power sector, to transmission line and uh, towers uh, of 33 kV, it was of the order of 82 uh, percent. 11 kV, it was 73 percent, and substations were 53 percent were down, and uh, 415 kV distribution lines and towers were about 46 percent. Next, uh, if you see the uh, photographs before and after, you can see on the top right. Uh, the electric tower, you can see it has gone uh, to the water. Uh, same way on the communication towers, you can see uh, that damage was quite extensive. Next. Uh, 
uh, what are the vulnerability factors so first factor that comes to my mind is design of this infrastructure this infrastructure has been designed uh, like over a period of time so uh, where we used old code and guides so that's the first thing uh, that uh, that is a weakest vulnerability factor second is material of construction uh, with the age material also get weakened aging infrastructure maintenance issues then uh, corrosion because of uh, saline water uh, all uh, state is along the sea so there is a lot of saline water then damage to foundation uh, such as uh, from the water loading next what are the challenges challenges are large network size uh, component level uh, understanding of the structural and non structural attributes is a big task and then asset management maintenance periodic inspection and condition monitoring as well as redundancy build the redundancy in the network so that we can do if a like one service station fail we can island that only that portion and uh, rest can be uh, like on the power next i think thank you and uh, we can have some discussions so, uh, thanks a lot sushil for uh, for setting the stage for uh, for vulnerability assessment and uh, <clears throat> and getting us an idea uh, into uh, a peek into the risk to uh, power infrastructure so uh, based on your experience and uh, and your understanding on the subject uh, what can be done to improve the performance of power infrastructure then? thank you that's an excellent question kuspen in fact <coughs> uh, uh, as i said exposure development developing this uh, entire network uh, uh, exposure development of this entire network in a digital uh, uh, digital way uh, like in geo uh, spatial uh, analysis and collecting their attribute of each and every network element so that should be the first task second task should be uh, like and this not only to the like power uh, transmission line and tower but from generation itself because when we say generation power stations are of different type for example nuclear power plant their vulnerability are different solar power plant their vulnerability is from wind is very high then we have a thermal plant which could be gas fired or coal fired uh, then we have wind turbines which are uh, like most affected uh, from the wind itself so uh, from uh, generation to transmission to distribution entire network has to be digitized uh, entire network exposure has to be collected and when i say Uh, exposure it is not just only the location but attribute what are the material what are the design code which has gone into it then next comes the vulnerability of course vulnerability through this design code and their condition monitoring asset management we can get all those factors where these are weigh and then we can do a, a risk assessment because we need to quantify so everything need to be quantified so when after getting the risk assessment we can do a cost benefit analysis to rank okay which which part of the infrastructure we should fix first so that's very important because uh, resources are limited so yeah. how I make a best make use of that yeah thanks a lot uh, for this uh, for your insights and um, i i hope this answer will uh, will help a lot of uh, um, uh, people who are listeners uh, are so next we'll move to uh, ms alpa chet um alpa is uh, one of the leading structural experts in india and uh, she has been part of several structural risk reduction initiatives um, and she has been a force uh, behind the design of building codes <coughs> in india and uh, she herself has designed numerous complex structures so welcome alpa and uh, we look forward to your insights on um, on the bridges uh, in india bridges are complex structures and are very important from a transportation perspective so we would like to understand from you uh, what is the state of bridges in india and what are some of the shortcomings uh, that basically makes our bridges uh, vulnerable thank you pushpendra for a very generous introduction uh, and uh, welcome good morning good afternoon good evening to everybody out there Uh, so she has already painted a broad brush picture of the vulnerabilities so without further ado let me move from the general to the specific and as pushpendra has said i'm going to focus on vulnerability in infrastructure that is bridges next slide 
Uh, let's see it. Next slide, please. Let's see it through the prism of three parameters, data, asset management, and redundancy. For a country with one of the finest information technology industries in the world, we can surely do better with the quality of our data, its collection and cataloging, its authenticity, the review protocol, and its accessibility. Next slide. Let me share the story of bridge data in India versus elsewhere in the world. See the US of A. Every four years, the American Society of Structural Engineers produces a report card for America's infrastructure that rates the condition and performance of American infrastructure, assigning letter grades based on the physical condition and needed investments for improvement. The committee assesses all relevant data and reports, consults with technical and industry experts, and assigns these grades. It has certain criteria it uses, such as capacity, condition, future need, operation and maintenance, uh, public safety, resilience, and so on. In India, back in 1996, the Roads Ministry commissioned a study for a bridge management system. Software was procured. The system, essentially a database software to be operated by engineers who had to be hired and trained, would assemble data based on numerous parameters. But the system failed. Why? Because the key piece was missing, trained engineers. Also missing was a department who took ownership of the project. Cut to 20 years later. The Indian Bridge Management System, or IBMS, was initiated by the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways with great fanfare and large fund allocation in December 2016. The objective was to create an inventory uh, of all bridges in the country and read the structural condition for further action. Data collection and, sh and sharing of it was subcontracted to private consultants with no standard operating procedures, no competency or qualification criteria for the data collectors, no training to the inspectors, and no peer review of the collected data. The Ministry of uh, the uh, MORT, or Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, claims it has inventorized uh, 172,500 odd bridges, including culverts, under this IBS, MS. But there is really no qualitative, credible information on the state of bridges. No government agency is taking ownership of the data. There is no sign off of the data by a government official. And the IBMS project was commissioned for a three year time frame. So by December 2019, all the field consultants' contracts were closed on an as is, where is basis, and no further steps have been taken to continue with this initiative. So basically, history repeats itself two decades on. Even this poor uh, database showed that 20% of bridges are in extremely bad state. Next slide, asset management. Asset management goes hand in hand with a good database. A thorough bridge inspection program helps to ensure small problems never become large ones. A team of bridge inspectors from the public and private sector qualified on all relevant competence criteria need to be trained to examine every component of a bridge to determine its physical condition. They need to be skilled in seeking the root causes of the deterioration and the strain which has been caused in the bridge. They need to recommend necessary corrective actions and they need to evaluate alternative repair rehabilitation methods that meet the specific needs of the bridge and the community. We do need to have this in place. Unfortunately, in the present situation in India, bridge maintenance authorities do not have sufficient budgetary support to undertake large volumes of distress management. The tendency is to develop specifications for cosmetic rectification of visible symptoms rather than to rectify and address the root cause of the defects. This leads to allowing the bridge to deteriorate further till a time when it can be declared critical and recommended for replacement. For example, during the five years of implementation of the IBMS, no major rehabilitation program was initiated. Next slide. The last parameter, redundancy, which I'm going to talk about. There are many other parameters, of course. Uh, there are many areas in the country where a town or region is connected to mainland through just one bridge or one mountain road. Collapse of that pathway isolates the region. If the areas of significance, multiple paths of access need to be ensured. 
Alternately, if that is not possible, then the development planning of that region should reflect the inherent vulnerabilities and discourage further growth. We all remember what happened in the case of the Surajbadi Bridge, the lone connector of Kutch to the rest of India in the 2001 Puj earthquake. Um, the old bridge was already badly deteriorated and experienced horizontal displacement of as much as 1.5 meters. It was therefore not uh, competent to carry any load. The new bridge was also uh, sufficiently damaged. And besides, it was not fully ready. The approach embankments, I'm sorry, was still to be constructed. Now, this situation caused huge impediments for rescue and relief in the first crucial week after the quake. Emergency repairs and balance construction were carried out on a war footing to make the new bridge functional. In closing, can we, uh, but can we wrap up quickly? <laughs> yeah, in closing, we know that many of our bridges are in poor condition. We just don't know how bad and exactly how vulnerable they are because the system of knowing does not really exist. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Alpa, for, uh, for your insights um, um, into the bridges. And uh, a quick question, you know, I am, uh, we are a little uh, behind the schedule. I would just like you to uh, take um, a few seconds to uh, put your thoughts on what the way forward would be considering where we are. So I think, uh, you know, at least for bridges, I would say they can just have, uh, you know, the <coughs> steps uh, for the short term is just resuscitate, uh, resuscitate the IBMS in a different avatar. In the medium term, I would say they need to train engineers and create a cadre of competent bridge engineers and bridge inspectors. And uh, in the long term, I would say we need to do the prioritization and triaging of the bridges and setting up a criteria for the same and actually having a plan to retrofit, uh, you know, 5% of the compromised bridges annually. It's pretty much the way uh, the US of A does it. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Alba. And uh, I, uh, this, has been, uh, this has been a lot of uh, interesting information that, that you have shared and very, very relevant and very prudent. Thank you very much. We Thank move you. forward to our uh, next panel, which is uh, basically getting into the, the crux of this, uh, this uh, session, which is the Pathways to Resilience. Uh, <clears throat> we'll start with uh, Dr. Ali Maher, uh, who is uh, a director of IT and a professor of civil and environment engineering at Rutgers. And he has been leading a CAIT as a tier one university transportation center, is spearheading um, research through innovative technologies. So uh, uh, Ali, uh, we would like to understand from you, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the situation of uh, the state of infrastructure resilience in US with a specific focus to transportation, because uh, that's, that is your core area. Ali. Uh, thank you, uh, Pushpendra. Uh, good morning, everyone. And, uh, you know, thanks uh, for the invitation to participate in, uh, in this panel discussion. If I could have my presentation. Thank you. Uh, could you please go to the next slide? Uh, so what, I, what I'm planning to do uh, within this uh, six, seven minutes is to provide a brief overview on the current state of practice in the U.S. on uh, primarily integrating climate change impacts and resiliency into transportation asset management, um, which I believe at this time is a timely topic uh, uh, because among other factors, we are now struggling uh, with the impacts of this fierce pandemic. And the uh, picture that is uh, in front of us is uh, basically provides a foretaste of what to expect from cumulative impacts of climate change and how we must essentially prepare to deal with it. Uh, what we find here in the uh, transportation um, uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, sector is we see these simil similarities between these impacts are striking and closer than what you may think. So that's just a segue here, but uh, important one. So. Uh, Resilience, um, you know, uh, uh, as, as you all know, means different things to different people. So where we live, uh, which organizations we present, we represent and uh, which hazards and assets um, and sectors we consider 
all help define the resilience uh, uh, for us. For example, our colleagues in the um, earthquake engineering community, they consider resilience an attribute uh, of organizations and consider a functional recovery in the shortest amount of time of primary importance uh, in providing resilience. Um, uh, uh, with respect to the transportation sector and assets, the goals are pretty much similar. Um, if you can go pre uh, to the next slide. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the objective here is again to, uh, to uh, uh, essentially to uh, increase or sharpen the slope of uh, recovery uh, uh, after big events. And that's pretty much the same um, overview and concept. Um, in the US, uh, next slide please. Uh, as with many other countries around the world, uh, I've been hearing uh, your uh, discussions uh, here today, pretty much the same issues. The intensity and frequency of hurricanes, uh, floods, uh, droughts, heat waves, and more intense wildfires are quite alarming. Um, uh, in 2018 and 19, we uh, had about more than $136 billion in monetary damage only, uh, you know, uh, aside from uh, loss of life and other more critical damage. Uh, we have had these uh, losses from weather disasters. And this uh, follows 2017, which was the year with the highest damage uh, ever with 16 weather events and a total damage of 306 billion. That, that is next slide, uh, please. Um, so as a result, um, of all these uh, events, um, and even before that, a view is emerging here uh, among uh, our transportation agencies and asset owners and planners and engineers uh, that when we account for resilience, uh, infrastructure design must include interdependencies, as uh, Pushpendra uh, alluded to a little bit earlier. The cascading effects uh, uh, are critical. And we should consider resilience uh, uh, a function of an ecosystem, essentially of tightly interconnected and interdependent physical, cyber, and hum human components. So that adds to the nonlinearity and the complexity of, of, the, uh, of the problem in doing vulnerability assessment, doing risk analysis, and ultimately, as uh, 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 Dr. Gupta mentioned, uh, doing benefit cost analysis, which will be critical. So, uh, so what we are also observing here is that the extreme climate change uh, is posing serious threat to transportation system, uh, interrupting essential services to people, communities, and so on. Uh, to provide a point of reference, a summary of US transportation uh, infrastructure inventory is shown in this slide on the left. Um, you know, we have the largest multimodal transportation infrastructure system in the world. Uh, it carries more than $10 trillion in goods, roughly about 60% of our GDP. And, but the challenge here is how do we maintain a state of good repair of all these assets, while at the same time, uh, you know, we are underspending in doing um, uh, maintenance and upkeep of these systems. We are only spending about 2.5% of our GDP annually, which as you can see here is uh, much less than your country. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the last two years, uh, US DOT, uh, just quickly about some recent developments, uh, it has funded a number of pilot projects across the country and has developed a range of tools and guidance uh, to assess and map uh, climate and extreme vulnerabilities vis-a-vis uh, -vis transportation assets. Um, and they have uh, provided guidance on how to evaluate adaptation options and how to integrate resilience uh, into asset management, which, which is the key issue here. How do we uh, integrate resiliency considerations into our asset management? Next slide, please. Um, you know, uh, the previous two speakers talked about uh, the vulnerability assessment, and th that is part of what uh, Federal Highway Administration in the US and US Department of Transportation did quite a bit of work on and came up with this new guideline. It is called Vulnerability Assessment and Adaptation Framework, which I highly recommend uh, if you ha don't have access to it, to look at it. It's free for download uh, from internet. Um, it was developed in 2018 and it provides an in-depth structured process 
for conducting vulnerability assessment, particularly uh, uh, for uh, transportation assets. Um, in addition, a uh, number of tools have, uh, and interfaces have been developed in the last two years. Please go to the next slide. Uh, uh, one tool which is of importance to us that uh, many of the states are beginning to use, and we have been using also on the, on the academic side in helping our industry partners, it's called RAMCAP. It's a methodology that is basically an all hazard risk and resilience management process for critical infrastructure. So these tools are out there, they are available. Um, and, but some of the, uh, uh, next slide, uh, some of the uh, research, the current research that uh, my team uh, in our center, we are engaged and also uh, uh, cuts across uh, various assets, include utilizing advanced data collection methods, uh, uh, you know, uh, to collect multi-dimensional data sets to produce a coherent view of disaster impacts, uh, utilizing advanced condition assessment, non-destructive testing, structural health monitoring of transportation infrastructure assets. Uh, or, uh, you know, um, uh, previously uh, there was a discussion about bridges and, um, you know, we have worked on building robotic systems for quick assessment of bridge conditions. You can see a picture here. Um, as a part of long-term bridge performance program for the U.S. Um, so these are areas that uh, are ongoing, research are actively ongoing. Uh, the analysis to determine the relationship, for example, between hurricane forces and structural and geographic factors of coastal infra infrastructure is a priority right now for us. And finally, uh, uh, among other important areas, utilizing artificial intelligence uh, methods such as computer vision and geometric computing methods to extract useful information from large spatial data sets. So I'll stop here and there are some um, um, uh, summaries and um, um, takes from um, what we have learned, some lessons learned, which I would respond uh, uh, during uh, the question and answer period. Thank you. I think I will just uh, wait for uh, the discussion to go over some of these yeah. slides. So uh, thanks a lot, Ali, for the uh, for um, your insights uh, on and enlightening us with the state of uh, affairs uh, with with the transportation resilience in uh, in U.S. I am um, uh, an immediate question that comes to my mind is. You know, with all that that is happening, you know, with so many uh, so many initiatives uh, being taken and uh, under implementation, uh, what is your take on the uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, the way it stands in US today? How will it perform if if uh, if another big event happens? Uh, very good question. So uh, I would say um, uh, two uh, critical uh, developments stand out. Uh, the first one is the mandate that uh, the uh, federal government is putting on each state to integrate resiliency into their asset management protocols. And uh, this is actually not being done uniformly. Some states are way ahead than others. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, folks are working on developing uh, uniform standards uh, and protocols um, you know, this work is ongoing. Uh, there is, but there is, however, a consensus that resiliency needs to be included at all levels of planning, design, and implementation. And the important thing here is that since uh, uh, government is mandating this, means that any project that requires federal dollars, then uh, the planning and execution of the project has to incorporate resiliency uh, into its design, planning, and implementation. The other important oh, wow. item, which again goes back to the challenge uh, of implementing resiliency at uh, local levels, is that as I go back to Dr. Gupta's presentation, uh, the, the issue of uh, providing benefit cost analysis, especially um, we need to show clear evidence, including cost benefit analysis to convince both the public and politicians that commitment to resilience management is as practical and necessary as any other priority. I think this is a key issue that uh, currently uh, uh, is a common understanding and common, uh, I would say, uh, um, consensus uh, among asset owners and stakeholders in the US. 
Great, thanks, thanks a lot, um, uh, Ali. And in fact, uh, while responding to your uh, the previous question, you have already given suggestions as to what uh, what those who are uh, jumping onto this uh, this area now um, need to focus on. So great, thanks a lot, Ali, for your for your thoughts and your uh, your suggestions. Uh, we now move on to um, uh, Mr. Pondrick. Uh, Mr. Pondrick is uh, the Director General at CDRI, which is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. Uh, he is also Advisor for Mitigation at the uh, National Disaster Management Authority of India. Nine, uh, 1993 IAS officer with over 25 years of experience, and a lot of that has been uh, in heading uh, and managing the infrastructure departments in several states. So welcome, Mr. Pondrick. Um, uh, uh, we would like to, uh, before we start discussion with Mr. Pondrick, uh, we would like to see a, sh a short video that uh, that talks that shows what the charter of CDRI is. So Rimjim, uh, could you please run the video? Resilient infrastructure is critical for people's well-being quality of life and economic prospects, irrespective of where they live. Inadequate and poorly built infrastructure blocks economic and social development. Increasing exposure to earthquakes, floods and tropical cyclones stresses infrastructure systems. Two-thirds of total economic losses in disasters are associated with infrastructure damage. As extreme weather events become more frequent and intense due to climate change, these losses are set to rise. The impact on small island developing nations and least developed countries is particularly severe. Disaster and climate resilient infrastructure is essential to the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals and to accelerate climate action. 94 trillion US dollars of global investment is needed to fill the infrastructure deficit by 2040. More infrastructure will be built in the next 20 years than in the last 200 years. Fortunately, achieving disaster and climate resilient infrastructure is not expensive. One dollar invested in strengthened resilience generates four dollars in avoided economic and social losses. The Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure is an international partnership that will support countries to build the disaster and climate resilient infrastructure they need. Championed by global leaders, CDRI will provide knowledge, technical support and capacity development to those countries with the greatest infrastructure challenges. Join us to achieve the SDGs and accelerate climate action by making all new infrastructure disaster and climate resilient. Thanks for, uh, for playing, the, uh, playing the video. Um, now we move on to um, uh, Mr. Pondrick and uh, let's uh, try to understand from him uh, uh, CDRI as an, as an nodal institution for infrastructure resilience what are the plans? How you uh, plan to bring that change? <clears throat> so thank you, Pushpendra. Uh, and thank you for giving this opportunity to CDRI. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, let me start by uh, saying that today is the International Day uh, for Persons with Disability. And in this context, the importance of <coughs> Uh, resilience of infrastructure becomes even more important uh, because we have to make this infrastructure not only resilient but resilience with inclusives uh, inclusiveness for everyone including uh, people for people with uh, disability so with that i will start uh, the presentation uh, the coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure uh, it was launched last year uh, by Prime Minister of India at the UN uh, Climate Action Summit uh, in New York. It's a, a multi-stakeholder partnership of countries, organizations, academic institutions, and private sector. Uh, the Secretariat is uh, based in New Delhi. Uh, next, please. As of now, 
18 countries and four multilateral organizations have joined the coalition. And if you see the map, uh, almost all continents are represented in the CDRI, uh, from small island countries to countries with more uh, expertise in disaster resilience to landlocked countries. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the major multilateral organizations also have joined the CDRI. Next, please. The CDRI mission is broadly in three parts. The first is technical support and capacity building of countries of at sub, uh, national as well as sub national level, uh, research and knowledge management. Uh, CDRI will be a knowledge institution, uh, develop and decimate uh, knowledge, disseminate knowledge, and then advocacy and partnership, as my previous speakers uh, mentioned that advocacy and partnership is one of the key areas in which we need to work. Next, please. CDRI has started uh, programs and uh, projects in many of the uh, infrastructure areas. And interestingly, what uh, Dr. Sushil Gupta mentioned about the phony cyclone and the resilience of power sector CDRI has started a project uh, to assess the resilience of power sector uh, in context of the phony cyclone. Uh, it, this work has already started and uh, after it is completed, it will be uh, extrapolated to other similar geographies in the world in member countries. So that mm -hmm. work has started in two, uh, three phases and the first phase is underway. Uh, similarly, CDRI will be working uh, uh, with on the airports. Next, please. Uh, CDRI will, will be working on airports also, and uh, we will be conducting risk and resilience assessments. So, uh, Dr. Alpa Shed mentioned about the resilience assessment. So, CDRI will be with uh, coordination and collaboration of member countries, we will be conducting resilience assessments in uh, key infrastructure areas. And some of that work has already started. Uh, CDRI will come with a biennial flagship report on the, on the disaster resilience status of the infrastructure in the world. Uh, this is a very ambitious project and the work has started in collaboration with UNDP on this. We expect the first report to be out in 2022. Next, please. CDRI has also started a fellowship program in which fellowships up to US dollar 10,000 will be given to researchers who will work on resilience infrastructure issues, who will do research and that uh, this fellowship program has been launched in September. The last date is in January. Uh, and we are expecting that uh, researchers from all over the world in, from member countries will apply for this fellowships. Next, please. The International Conference on Disaster Resilient Infrastructure has been scheduled in uh, March. This is the third such event being organized by uh, CDRI. And the major theme of this conference is uh, that we will, work, we will talk about uh, disaster resilience, including nature-based solutions. And we have already started events in run up to this conference. Next, please. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned that in the three themes CDRI is working, we will be working on recovery, recovery and reconstruction, on disaster finance, capacity development, uh, standards is a major area, and governance and policy. Next, please. Now, Mr. Pondrick, if you could uh, quickly summarize, please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, one more. Next, please. Next, please. So yeah, that, that was it. So I hope CDRI with a, as a multi-stakeholder uh, organization will be able to uh, work on the areas which we are discussing today. That's all from my side. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Pondrick. Thank you very much for uh, for giving a perspective. And uh, there are lots of hopes uh, you have enlightened <laughs> by talking about what the CDRI is really um, uh, planning to achieve. Uh, we quickly move on to our last panelist, uh, Mr. Jeff uh, Uwema. Jeff uh, is uh, is a planner by profession and. Um, as the MD of the Info Planning Group based out of Virgin Islands. So Jeff, uh, quickly, we would like to understand uh, the planner's perspective here. You have been, uh, <clears throat> you have heard the researcher, you have heard the, uh, the administrator. Now we want to hear what the planner, uh, what is the planner's perspective to all this? Uh, yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Pushmindra, thanks for inviting me to this forum. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, really, uh, you know, listening to the presentations um, uh, uh, this evening, uh, you know, planning is done um, and planners uh, tend to uh, consult experts, uh, tend to look at risk information, um, tend to um, uh, developed well-focused plans, but the problem is, is really operationalizing the plan. So building awareness and understanding is good, but it often doesn't really translate into actions. And so what we've seen in the Caribbean with uh, Irma and Maria that has impacted the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico um, is that there was really a quick haste to re rebuild uh, infrastructure quickly. So what has happened is that uh, a lot of the planning uh, towards risk reduction was kind of tossed out of the window due to kind of uh, short-term pressures. And the focus was on the asset uh, versus the actual systems and how it functions. So, what happens is the asset is restored, but there's still brittleness and there's still a lack of robustness within the, the system. So the, the ability of the system to withstand is not there. So, you know, we ask what can be done. And I, I want to say, well, let's look at the human elements, if you will. Um, and that sounds very simple, but uh, we, sh we really need new approaches of thinking about resilience um, and infrastructure systems, looking at the interdependencies, but also looking at the people that manage and operate the systems and looking at capacity to in a more incremental and long-term approach if we're going to truly build resilience. And so, you know, is there the ability to monitor um, uh, the systems? Is there a financial capability to maintain uh, the systems? And a big one is, is there um, an ability to understand the data um, that is presented by experts um, uh, like uh, that's uh, part of this panel to uh, this evening um, to really help make those decisions. So as you do a cost benefit analysis, uh, looking at how to use that information to optimize investments about the assets, but also looking at focusing um, investments towards the governance systems and not just in terms of a one-off capacity technical training. I think the shift is really needed to say, look, we're running an infrastructure system. Um, we don't really need the capacity to develop a, a risk assessment program. What we really need to Thanks, do is um, build the capacity. To, yep, to use the yep, data. We'll have to, we'll have to wrap up. We are, we are just okay. close, <laughs> closing okay. to our time. So uh, great. Um, uh, thanks a lot for your, uh, for your, uh, for the planner's perspective, Jeff. And from my side here, we are coming close to this. I hope uh, this, uh, this session would have been useful to our listeners.
and um, <clears throat> I thank all my panelists for giving their time, especially Jeff and Ali. Uh, they are awake late night. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pondrick. Thanks, Alpa. And thanks a lot, Sushil. And once again, I hope uh, this would have been useful to my listeners. Here, if you have any questions that you would like to, uh, to send across to our panelists, please send them either to me or to info at rmsi.com. We'll be happy to get you all the answers by uh, discussing with them. Thank you very much for joining us for this, uh, for this community session, session. And uh, good luck to everybody for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.